everyone, and welcome to the Joe Schmo Show. This is episode number six, and today I'm joined by my co-host Jefferson Nunn, Emilio, and Sheldon Weisfield. I met Sheldon uh, a few years back. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the first time, but one of the most memorable times was at the CES event in Las Vegas, one of the largest uh, trade shows for all the technology people and all that. And I think this was the year that Roger was... Uh, incarcerated, so they had a, a robot of uh, Roger Bear, Bear running around the uh, CES. Right. He could still talk to people. And yeah. uh, Sheldon had the only uh, Bitcoin ATM there at CES and was really uh, really pushing for the uh, ATM industry and, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, we wanted to start off the show by just talking about uh, basically um, a, a brief intro of who Sheldon is first. Sheldon, would you like to give a brief intro on yourself there? Yes, thank you, Michael, and, and it's exciting to speak to you and your community and your audience that's uh, obviously leaders and shakers and movers in the world of the crypto ATMs. I call cryptos with the acronym VASETS, virtual assets. And CoinVault ATM is a very interesting story. I built a cellular telephone company in the early 90s called Prepaid Wireless Services. And in the evolution of the deregulation prior to 1996 of deregulated telecommunication cellular telephones, phones were for people that were rich and affluent. And the premise was if you could take the barrier to entry, which was credit, out of the equation, everybody could have a cellular telephone. And that is a stored value system that uh, is was the impetus to getting introduced to Bitcoin. And in 2013, I got introduced to Bitcoin, so obviously it was already evolving. And I tried to buy some Bitcoin and I found it very challenging. And it was uh, literally just a pain in the ass. I could afford it. I understood the technology. I understood the risk. Relatively speaking, I met the smart and rich rule. Challenge was how to buy it. And I realized that if we were going to mainstream this technology, you had to create an easy on ramp, easy off ramp. And the boys over at Robocoin were working on a Bitcoin ATM. I took my CIO from prepaid wireless services days. We flew out to California to meet them. They stood us up. So we ended up having to hop another plane over to Las Vegas to meet with them. And when I saw it, I said, okay, we'll buy these things. Let's get them launched. Excellent decision. Said, I'm sure that you were uh, very pleased that you didn't just go home after they stood you up the first time there. Well, you know, sometimes we have to remember, Michael, as entrepreneurs, we have to be persistent. We've got to be willing to knock a lot of doors. We've got to be willing to get kicked in the ass because we are the pioneer. We are doing things differently than what other people are doing. You, Michael, are an example of that. Jefferson in, in your initiatives, Emilio's in his initiatives. And, and so even though they stood us up, I just decided we'll hop the plane to wherever they were at, and we met them in Vegas wanted to see that they actually had a physical machine. I'm not going to talk about them as a company. The whole idea is, is they were a pioneer. They were the leader at the moment. The U.S. had not seen one of these machines yet. And I came back to Texas, and because I had been in business, I hired attorneys to look at it. And most people told me that you can't do this. There's no legal compliance. There's no framework. And I had to revert back to the 90s of launching prepaid wireless before the DCOM uh, the uh, Deregulation Act of 1996, and how do you engage into an emerging market if you really feel there's a pent-up demand? And that's what this technology represents to me, is there's a pent-up demand in a global front. Coin Vault ATM was born. We launched our first Bitcoin ATM in spite of all the regulatory compliance issues. Where was but your what first really, ATM? Our first ATM went into Austin, Texas. And uh, uh, we displayed one then uh, shortly thereafter at CES. That's where you and I met and several of the other guys that were then attempting to launch ATMs into the market in 2015. The challenge in 2014 was there was no regulatory framework. There was no guidelines. So I hired attorneys and I said, look, guys, write me the plan. Before we ever generated our first dollar of revenue, we had a full AML policy we had a KYC policy, of course, for those that may not be familiar, the acronyms of anti-money laundering, know your customer, and a counterterrorism strategy. Because <laughs> I, hired, I hired a banking attorney, and I said, okay, how do I do this? We, there was no laws. There was no regulation about it. And so many it's people were telling me. It's still too vague even today. 
Yeah. Well, that's the challenge we're faced with it. And even as I introduced myself into the communities between Austin, Texas, which had a very vibrant community, uh, Houston had an emerging communities. So many of the folks were telling me, don't worry about regulation, just do it. What scared the hell out of me was that Charlie Schramm had just gotten arrested in New York for his involvement in providing liquidity into the marketplace. And I felt like I could afford three meals in a cot. I don't need one provided to me by the government. Right. So the uh, topic of discussion evolves then to what we know in Texas is the ruling 1037 that so many of the other states have now adopted, which effectively states that so long as we're selling from our own inventory on our own behalf, we're not operating as an exchange. We're not uh, acting as a really a money transmitter. As long as you're only we, selling your own Bitcoin. We are only selling our own Bitcoin and we only buy for our own behalf. So Coin Vault ATM uh, was, is a registered money service business under the guidelines of the uh, FinCEN under the United States Department of Treasury. And we were successful in creating a relationship with a bank knowing exactly what we were doing, dealing with their tech-centric uh, banking communities in Silicon Valley and additional offices in Austin, Texas. They gave us letters of approval for us to operate, and uh, we were able to successfully launch. So here we are fast forward now, five years into the industry, and we see the landscape of how many ATMs are there, Michael, in the world now you're seeing? 5,479 today, according to Coin ATM Radar. 5,479. I remember when that list was seven. Uh, me as well. Absolutely. I, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And we've seen the little small units. We've seen the big units. We've seen these bait grade units that were manufactured under the guidelines for the Robocoin brand. And uh, I never risks... would have imagined that there would be even a thousand Bitcoin ATMs. And uh, I bought my first ATM in December of 2013. And wow. I never then would have ever thought thousands of Bitcoin ATMs. That was not even the, this was a hobby kind of a thing. I was just interested in seeing what was going on. It, it just shocks me how fast this industry has grown. Yeah. Well, it's fast in one breath and slow in the other because we're dealing with all the regulatory matters relative to your operation in a fully compliant matter. Corn Vault ATM also got served with a notice under the guidelines of FinCEN for a full audit. I'd like to know more about that. I haven't had the pleasure of a full audit from FinCEN yet. And the full audit was quite an experience. Because the nature of our business was oriented towards fully being fully compliant, I'm highly humbled and honored that we got a report back with what's called a no recommendations report. Nice. Never, would, never would I do a transaction without full KYC, and that's where the controversy comes in, the AML, KYC, counterterrorism policies, procedures, and compliance framework that some of the other entrepreneurial uh, efforts of other companies were not focused on regulatory compliance. And I just felt from the very beginning, we're dealing in a landscape that we're putting our heads into the mouth of the proverbial lion. And you're going to get your head bit off if you're not doing this thing right. Look at what happened to the young man in, in California recently. He's going to do prison time for being complicit in illegal and illicit activities. And we had people, million. Yeah, we had people that would literally, I don't know if we can say it or not, motherfuck us on the phone to set them up an account to do transactions. And my rule of thumb was if they were discussing any applications for any legal or illicit activities, then it wasn't worth us making a dollar or two to have to get into that trap in the future and what that might cost us. So it's, I just, it's just not worth it for that minority of the business. That's uh, a big problem. Uh, yeah. It's not worth it uh, long term wise. It just doesn't make money. It's more lawyers, more problems, more. Uh, yeah, Jeff. Well, how about the other side of the business? I, I hear you focus a lot on the regulatory side and protecting yourself from from those kind of threats. Most, even most uh, regular ATM owners don't have to deal with, right? But then right. there's the other side, which is, you know, the regular ATM insurer have insurance for vandalism, theft, that sort of thing. I know it's really hard to get insurance as a Bitcoin ATM owner. And like uh, a few days ago, some guys literally walked into a mall with a U-Haul truck 
and drove off with the Bitcoin ATM. They even put a tarp over the Bitcoin ATM. So I, I saw the video of this. Yeah, they just walked in with the dolly right after the ball closed and calmly walked out with the ATM and threw it in the back of their truck and uh, drove off. Well, and, and that's a very interesting point. We had we've developed specific policies and procedures for where our ATMs would be placed and how they would be installed. All of our ATMs are bolted to the floor. And the access to the bolts in the floor, the bolts are half inch round bolts. They're drilled into the floor, not less than four inches into the concrete. Wow. And uh, we use a two inch washer on the top of them. So if someone's going to steal one of our ATMs, they're probably going to have to do it with a wrecker truck to try to yeah. steal it. We've never had an ATM stolen, but unfortunately, we have had them vandalized and we've had them destroyed. Uh, we did have an ATM. Uh, well, and then the robbery side of it, Michael, and your listening audience you may realize that ATMs can be two way. They can be one way. You have a bill acceptor, you have bill dispensers, or you have a bill recycler. And each of those devices operate uniquely to their specific application. In the ATMs that we used, they were designed in a bank grade fashion. So they've got a big bill acceptor container, and it's got two separate bill dispenser containers. One and of that course, a big safe with all the Bitcoins in it, right? And, and then there's the flip side to what is the asset, what is the virtual asset that's being dispensed through the network that this ATM is connected to is coming off of a server offsite. So the, the novelty idea that a Bitcoin ATM has Bitcoins in it is a fallacy. There is no, no hot wallet stored on our ATMs. And we have had an ATM... One ATM got toppled over, destroyed with a sledgehammer, got into the safe, and these idiots used sledgehammers. Rather than just pushing one little button that slides the container out, push the other button that lifts the lid up. I mean, how else do you service these things? No, they took sledgehammers and destroyed each one of the containers. And to the point that one of the ATMs, the one ATM that got robbed on site, they smashed it. They pulled the dispenser out. Excuse me. They, they pulled the container for the bill acceptors. The ATM had just been serviced the day before. So the dispensers were full of cash. The acceptor had no cash in it at all. So they destroyed a $35,000 machine, and they got nothing out of it. Nothing. Uh, I, I've had it where they've uh, regularized and uh, stolen the money out of machines, and they didn't realize that there was an acceptor and a dispenser. They would just take the dispenser cassette and run off because they didn't uh, and uh, most bitcoin atm operators I, i'm pretty sure it's the same down there for you uh, sheldon uh we do a lot more business with the incoming uh money we get a lot more cash in bitcoin going out so our dispensers usually don't have as much cash as the acceptors do it's a yeah. small part of our business most recently we have a warehouse facility where we had been pulling the atms from around the state into our central facility for a pivot that we're working on and somebody broke into that facility and literally sledgehammer smashed every single one of the dispenser cases and the bill acceptor cases and out of two of the atms they stole the computers out of them now what are you thinking you're going to find on the hard drive in that computer operating software absolutely bitcoin absolutely not so I think the world needs to understand that in the evolution of the science and technology that blockchain technology represents and these types of tokens, that these tokens are not stored on that ATM. They're going out to a central server somewhere, pulling down out off of your centralized hot wallet that you can immediately dispense to the customer when the customer is buying the crypto from us. Yeah, that's how it works with most operators. Amelia? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, I think the only machine I've ever had that had, has had like an API key stored on it itself was a Sky, uh, which was a little weird, but every other one is on cloud. I think that Chain Teller actually did this with their software, and so did Dave, which is this uh, ATM software out of New York oh. Bitcoin Center, New York City. 
they actually we have a big problem with this because we tried using some of these other softwares on some of the easy bit atms and in some countries like vietnam for example um downloading a 200 gigabyte blockchain over a 3g modem or over a unstable wi-fi at a coffee shop or wherever the atm is located is just not uh, feasible it just uh, it, it takes weeks it's very difficult everybody else that's using that internet then can't and i actually thought it was absolutely ridiculous that they tried to implement it this way and then their future thoughts were okay well um we're going to use electrum then on every machine instead and it's like why why can't we just i don't know if it was a full node thing or something they're trying to do but why can't we just use a centralized server rpc calls were built into bitcoin daemon from I, I would assume day one yeah yeah, exactly. yeah, and the other thing too is we have to think about the uh, capital requirements. If you're going to effectively keep your inventory stored on each mas machine specifically, your re capital requirements for inventory becomes Sky astronomical. Yeah. yeah, and and so the whole idea is we have to understand how much liquidity we maintain in each of the virtual assets that we're going to be vending in a central depository so that we can then dispense them upon calls. And then if we need to reload uh, our inventory, then we can reload the inventory into the central depository. Right, and that's how some people are doing it, but there's also other, I know some ATM companies over here in Europe are tying in directly to exchanges. So every time there's a transaction uh, that takes place, uh, Bitstamp or whoever is sending the Bitcoins, that they don't even ever touch the Bitcoins uh, as an intermediary. That's not how EasyBit works, but... Uh, I know that's how there's some operators as well. So there's a lot of different ways that you can, uh, yeah, actually execute this. But in Texas, if you want to go back maybe for a little bit to uh, this Texas Bill 1037, I think it is House Bill 1037, um, and explain to us a little bit more about that uh, for uh, the guests uh, on our show or for the listeners on our show that are not um, in the ATM industry, because uh, we went through it really quickly there, and I'm sure Emilio and I and Jeff understood it, but maybe. Um, some of our listeners would like a little more detail. So, absolutely, Michael. So, the, 1037 was the evolution of us launching CoinVault ATM under guidance from our attorneys appealing to the Texas Department of Banking and Regulatory Affairs. And within one month of us launching, they passed this bill. And effectively, what the bill does is it outlines the regulatory framework under the Texas Department of Banking and Regulatory Affairs perspective that we are not a money transmitter because effectively what happens, we own, the company owns the crypto, if it be Ethereum, if it be Bitcoin of any one of the thousands. The now asset, as you call oh, it, the asset. The assets, the virtual assets. And these virtual assets then are held in our inventory. And we sell from those and we buy for our own benefit to reload those. Where... The challenge would be is if you're a money transmitter or you're a brokerage, in some cases, you could effectively just have an account at the exchange and you could buy and sell a virtually real time at the exchange and then deliver it. The challenge with that real time delivery method as well is that you have the requirements to get these confirmations. And sometimes the challenge has been understanding how long does it take between the time you execute the order to the time that you can actually retransmit or send or forward those tokens sometimes can be a major issue if block times or hours and these kind of things uh so as i was sharing with the, your audience the 1037 ruling gave us the framework under which we could operate in a totally legal and compliant way with the uh, from the understanding of Texas Department of Banking and Regulatory Affairs, because we know that each state is very fragmented in their rulings and their guidelines. To me, it was important that we operate fully compliant. I had the privilege also to speak with several other states and other chairmen of the Departments of Banking and Regulatory Affairs. I had the privilege to be a guest speaker in the state of Massachusetts and dealing with their regulatory and legal network, and they have adopted a very similar ruling as well. So the idea is in each of your communities, states, or countries that you represent, it's how do we get ourselves poised and positioned for this global adoption? And it's, I think it's just one little step at a time, one initiative at a time. 
And so with the this ruling 1037, 1037, did it actually make things easier for you to open a bank account, for example, or to get insurance on ATMs or these kind of well, things? And Michael, those are all great questions. The banking piece, yes, we were able to present 1037 to the banks. But you know, you have state regulatory, then you have federal regulatory. And so although the banks did agree to open bank accounts for us under the name Coin Vault ATM with full disclosure as an MSB, eventually each of these financial institutions that Coin Vault did business with shut us down. Uh, we had financial institutions that banked us for years. We have the shortest bank shut us down in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That's just crazy. Yeah. So on that subject of banking, I've been a strong advocate and a proponent that the industry should identify a strategy to create a financial infrastructure so that we can access the Federal Reserve Network. I dealt with the uh, federal regulatory authorities that issue what's called SPNBs. It's a special purpose national bank charter to the point that they asked me to write their guidelines. They figured, hey, if you could be if you could facilitate Texas to pass that rule, maybe you could help us on a federal level. I saw so many people in our industry that it appealed to get an SPNB charter with no success. And the most valuable resource each of us have here today is our time. And I'm honored to spend and invest my time in this community to educate people because I'd like to see other pioneers as yourself, Michael, as yourself, Emilio, obviously Jeff and your efforts. How do we build a knowledge base that's built on integrity. And from that foundation, we'll see mass market adoption. If we're coming at it from a duplicitous uh, perspective, other people coming at it from a legal illicit perspective, that's not going to gain the confidence that we need in the marketplace. We have to save each other some time and all work together on this. There's no other way. Amen. Amen. So Hopefully the, the evolution some some of the ruling the mistakes of we made. Yeah, let's not all have to make the same mistakes. It, how do we build a community that is willing to be open and sharing without being concerned about being competitive? Because at the end of the day, we have an entire global marketplace. There's plenty of market share out there for us. How do we work together to do it? The federal levels of banking becomes the challenge because the conduit of the fiat, the government issued currencies have to be able to move through the infrastructure of the central banking authorities. And how do we do that in the US? It's about how do we get into the Federal Reserve so we can use the inter uh, interconnected networks geographically to allow a third party facilitator, a logistics company, the likes of Brinks or Loomis or any of those other companies to pick our cash up in a safe, secure manner and get it back into our infrastructure through the virtual vault networks that so many of the financial institutions have. Otherwise, somebody's just going to get hurt here. I mean, this is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. We can't have, uh, we have no infrastructure to do this right now. Yeah, and that's the challenge. Those that use armed guards or other uh, security methods to, to handle their cash or they're using unmarked private cash handling services, which still puts people at risk. So now we move unnecessarily to as well. We already have infrastructure for this. Yeah, the yeah. shopping bags, people, right? Exactly. Uh, I was talking so about I, this on the last show. <laughs> yeah. Ironically, we see people with a lunch bag with a paper bag full of cash. Yeah. That there's no joke. We yeah, had that, people, that, that was B. <laughs> oh. Yeah. We had people ride the buses to Dallas, Texas to go take the cash out of the ATMs to turn around and walk it across the street to the Bank of America where at one point we had a bank account to to accept the cash to turn around to get back on the bus to come back to Houston or to go to Austin or wherever else we had these ATMs deployed. So I want to fast forward where we're at in the banking and the evolution of banking. What we see now is I've had the privilege to go to uh, Puerto, uh, uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, not, yeah, to, uh, oh, I'm in Puerto Vallarta today to uh, Puerto Rico and look at the banking framework that's there. And they have created a very unique type of a charter where so there's Turpin's a always talking about too. Yes, I had a privilege of meeting with Mr. Turpin while we were down in Puerto Rico as well. There is a financial institution that has a charter based in Texas that we are working in coordination with a group to facilitate handling the cash in the ATM network. With this financial institution having a charter 
inside of the Federal Reserve, then we can use a third party logistics company that can facilitate the cash vault service and then funnel that cash back into our infrastructure. And this is going to be critical. We're going to see several other industries that can benefit from it as well. I mean, they have the same uh, cash logistics problems in the marijuana industry and uh, the hemp industry, uh, and many, many industries. It's not just Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrency. That's correct, Michael. And so I think I see the evolution that we're going to have a solution coming down uh, the pipeline, hopefully in the next six to nine months. The opportunity exists right now, Michael. You know, I mentioned to you offline about perhaps us creating a financial resource to facilitate an entity like this in some kind of a cooperative effort that we could all benefit from. Along with, I mean, one of the challenges that I see that affects, well, just everybody uh, is that lack of that, that very resource that even lobbyists, I, I hate to use the L word, but even lobbyists have a lobby on the behalf of interests in that industry. One of the things that I already see coming down is the IRS issue. Uh, the IRS is sending out letters asking, you know, just regular people for a massive amount of compliance that would probably be impossible to comply with. Uh, those letters are asking for details on profit and loss on individual transactions for exchanges that don't even exist anymore. There's no records for them anymore. It's impossible to go back to, you know, four years ago and try to figure out what happened. So do you think this uh, financial regulatory network might be able to help out with issues like with the IRS? Because right now the IRS, they're getting their advice from the accountants and the accountants don't know the first thing about Bitcoin. Jeff, I have to laugh because I recently received one of those letters and I've been contemplating. I just received it a week or so ago. I think and, everybody in this uh, uh, show today, we all received the uh, wonderful letter. Oh, okay. And, and I've actually been contemplating how to respond to it. And fortunately, Coin Vault ATM has been fully compliant. All their record keeping, everything's in place. And for myself, I have, I've only been accumulating. So for me, it's a, little, it's a much simpler model for me to identify where I've bought, having never sold. And so I guess I'm one of those, you can define me as a hodler. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just holding on and anticipating what we see the future is. Even when it hit 20,000, I was advised or thereabouts about selling. And like I told some other folks, you know, there's t we're in, everyone's in a different situation. I'm in a situation where I don't need the profit. I'm in it for the long term. I'm not going to sell. But on the other hand, if you've made a profit and you feel comfortable from a profitability perspective, take your profit, pay your taxes and call it a day. I'm not an in and out guy. I don't watch the charts. I like to know what the net worth is. It's very exciting to see. Keep an Obviously, eye on the community behind it. Yeah, seeing, seeing what's going on in the community, participating in our local meetups. But to the particular subject of getting this letter, we all have a responsibility to be compliant. And however we can keep the best records to our best ability, that's what we need to be responsible to. And that's how I address that. Well, happens, in my though? case, I mean, I sent it off to my tax preparer uh, to try to figure out because in my case, I was actually, uh, I hired uh, people all around the world to do work for me and I paid them in Bitcoin. So, but I didn't keep track of, you know, what the Bitcoin price was when I sent, you know, uh, say not one Bitcoin or one, even one Bitcoin to pay somebody in India at the time, right? 2014, 2015. So, uh, so yeah, now I have to go back and try to figure out if I made any money on that. And I have no idea. So far as easy bits concerned, I mean, yeah, the ATMs keep pretty good records and we've been very compliant. We have records of all the easy bit transactions, but me personally, uh, I'm in the same kind of a boat where, you know, I was traveling around the world. I was hiring people in different countries. I was paying everyone in Bitcoin. I was, I was, I should have been a, a holder more. Uh, I, I was not quite as wise as Sheldon, but uh, I spent a lot of my Bitcoin when I was uh, traveling and meeting people and going to conferences. I mean, should I give away uh, probably hundreds, if not thousands of Bitcoins uh, in the early uh, couple of years of Bitcoin just to everyone I knew and everyone I met at a conference and et cetera. So 
Um, it's just really difficult personally when I wasn't doing this as a business. You know, my my personal holdings are completely different than EasyBit, where we had a bookkeeper and an accountant and everything. Personally, I you know a lot of stuff was seemed very minor at the time, and uh, you know it's, I, it is I do feel going to be a big mess to uh, figure out. I do agree with Sheldon though. I think that it's important to um, to keep track of this stuff, but you have to remember that in the beginning, a lot of this stuff was. Uh, negligible you know uh you could uh, you know what was an ounce of weed on silk road was probably 300 bitcoin or something back then so i mean 400 bitcoin or something so i mean it's very easy to have bitcoin that are sitting in a wallet and lose the password to it because you know it just didn't matter back then or bitcoin that have forked in all these different things that you don't know are worth and you don't know where they are all these i i just think that it should be a I'm glad that Coin Vault, that Coin Vault is a uh, very compliant and has very good records and such. I think that's probably uh, more than the average exchange that I've worked with uh, uh, personally when I was trading myself and such over the years. So I think that if we could get everybody up to a standard where the businesses were keeping track of things and reporting things properly, it would make things a lot easier for personal people like consumers, not your average Bitcoin business, but your average Bitcoin er. <laughs> and Michael, we recognize we're in a multi-billion dollar industry, you know, on the urge of trillion dollars where we hit that mark nearly already once, that how we play this, I'm going to call it the game, is about being compliant. And those that aren't will get hurt. They will get shut down. Some of them might be able to play the game for a short period of time. And they'll vanish and we'll never see them again. And it's the unfortunate facts that there will be some shysters that will take advantage of some folks. And all we can tell them is, we're sorry, but that's not us. You operating your network, Emilio with his network. Our we objective get those is calls every day. Yeah. Our objective is to provide a good product at a fair price and in a safe way. And so long as we deliver on that, then we've achieved our responsibilities. And then you and we all know as operators that then we have the customers. It's like, well, I lost my keys. You know, how do I get it back? I bought it from you. Don't you have a way to reset it? And it's like, we're sorry. We, you know, it was in your care, custody and control. It was your responsibility. And if you lost your hundred dollar bill, you can't go to the bank and say, this was the serial number on my hundred dollar bill. I want it back. I mean, we Not get this. Happen. We get this all the time, and we have. We had one guy servicing an ATM one time, one of our technicians, and a line started to queue up, people waiting, and uh, there was this uh, lady there, and she says, "Oh yeah, you know, like I found this RV. It's seventy uh, percent off. Uh, I found it on eBay. All I got to do is pay with Bitcoin." Oh dear. And so you know, the the guy explains to them or to her. He says, uh, "You know, that's you're definitely going to get scammed here." You understand that once you put the money in and the Bitcoin goes to this person, you will never be able to get your Bitcoin back. And she's like, no, 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 it's the best deal. Just hurry up and fix the machine. I really need it. And so he calls me and he says, hey, Mike, I got this lady here at the machine and I'm 100% sure that she's about to get ripped off. And I've told her this over and over and over again. And like, I haven't turned the machine back on yet because she's going to stick her money in there and get ripped off. What do you want me to do? And, you know, it comes to the point where it's like, you know, I can't, I don't really want to tell someone, sorry, uh, you know, you're going to get ripped off here. I, I know it for sure. Uh, and she's just like, you're going to make me miss my best deal ever. What I, but what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to say, you know, no. But, of course, she ended up putting her money in the machine. She got ripped off. The police give me a call and want to know what happened and everything. But, I mean, people have to get into a mindset of, also, with Bitcoin, it's great that there's regulations out there, and it's great that uh, some of the companies, especially these days, are getting more compliant. But you still have to, with Bitcoin, remember that you are responsible for your own money, your assets, as Sheldon likes to call them. Um, no, There's no centralized authority where you're going to be able to call them up and say, hey, uh, I got scammed, I want my money back. You know, So it's a very, very different mindset where, with cryptocurrency, you have to be responsible for your own money money it's a great thing for those that are looking to be responsible for their own money but for some of the average consumers who aren't used to it and aren't paying that much attention you have to really kind of wake up a little bit 
what do you think, Emilio? You haven't said much over there. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, I, I, we get all these calls all, all about people doing crazy things, uh, you know, when we warn them not to do it. Uh, women sending money to boyfriends, so I, I told them if, if they've never met them in real life, well, and regardless, they probably shouldn't be sending a huge amount of money to these people. Um, and I do it. And, you know, I your back from that as as uh as to what, whether or not it was a scam but i mean i'm 100 percent sure they're getting scammed so yeah no no good people have to be responsible and uh and some people i just you know, honestly i feel like some people maybe they shouldn't be, be in charge of their own money because they're they're reckless and they're gonna lose it all and that's probably and why there's there's a lot of people that don't have that much money yeah, exactly. And, you know, remember when people put money into these ATMs, most of it's coming from a bank. So, I mean, you don't you don't hear the lady that gets ripped off trying to buy the RV. Uh, she calls me. She doesn't call Bank of America or whoever uh, gave her the cash that she got uh, ripped off from. She, uh, you know, they assume it's, you know, it's not Bitcoin's fault that people are stupid. It's a human problem. That's true. Uh, actually, I, I had this really weird weird case in uh, I think it was in Connecticut where this woman withdrew money from her bank account um, and it was a social security administration scam uh, and she she bought a lot of Bitcoin at her machines and the bank actually reimbursed her uh, even though she withdrew cash which was really uh, I've never heard and then of I that had this other case that rare. This, you know really really crazy um, and then I had this other lady in uh, Florida. Uh, she withdrew all the money from her bank account. She asked the uh, branch manager that the Social Security Administration needed all of this money because she was in problems. And they actually let her with. Um, and then she purchased money, uh, purchased Bitcoin from our, our uh, machines, and, and she used all of her money. Um, oh, that's and she horrible. has like five kids. It was a terrible, terrible mess. And really Emilio, bad, can you but, turn off your uh, video? Maybe it'll make your audio better. Oh, yeah, let's see. Hold on one second here. Yeah. All right, so yeah. Um, Watch my so, so she, she would draw a line from, uh, from Chase. Uh, Chase didn't stop her from doing this, even though it was clearly a scam. Um, the police were actually really upset with Chase because... <laughs> You know, they, it, she explicitly told them what was going on, and they didn't like refuse uh, the withdrawal, even though they probably should have, because this woman was uh, she wasn't she's not really a, a native of this country, so she was a little bit confused, um, and she purchased Bitcoin from her machines and. I have the opposite all problem. Every time I go to a bank and tell them I want a bunch of cash, it takes me uh, explaining all day long before they'll give it to me. Right. right. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I, in my they, view, they I shouldn't really have to tell them anything about what I, what I want my money for or where it's going. <laughs> well, I you guess know? where it came from, maybe, but not where it's going shouldn't be their business, the banks at least. Well, one thing, I mean, I really wish uh, in regular schools uh, they spent a lot more time on money management and that sort of thing. I mean, you get kids graduating, they know chemistry, they know algebra. They know physics. They don't know the first thing about money management. They know debt, though. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but that's, but, that's but, a good uh, point, Jeff. That should be a prerequisite to graduation. Should be. You have to yeah. learn how to balance your checkbook. Well, yeah. what I would share with you guys about the cash issue is we created a relationship with a bank where we actually had to order cash in advance. And in some of the larger financial institutions, interestingly, while the smaller financial institutions that were considered retail merchant banks, they always had plenty of cash. You could pick up 50, 60, 80, $100,000 in cash any given time without having to order it. And uh, we're in the real estate business as well. And my partner uh, and I, we buy real estate for cash at the courthouse steps. And the larger financial institutions uh, to be unnamed, but you know the top five, all require you to order the cash in advance. And that just seems really scary to me to realize that how fractionalized banking actually works. 
and that these guys don't have the cash. That's right. So we all need to be mindful of what this technology represents as a store of value. I give no financial advice, investment advice, but just to recognize that there is an evolution, there is a cycle, and perhaps this technology represents the clear path to the evolution and the cycle of what we're going to see store value to look like. Because of its functional ability, its security, its fungibility, and the underlying characteristics that it represents is clearly, to me, the representation of what our future has to store. So I would say to the listening audience, if those of you that are just learning about crypto, you should own some. If as little as $10, you can go to a Bitcoin ATM. Michael, what's the smallest denomination you can buy through your network? On our machines in the U.S., you can put in $1. And I don't know if it's still the way, but for a couple of years, we had a promotion where if you bought $1, we didn't charge you anything. It was exactly $1 worth of uh, Bitcoin. But then wow. one of the waitresses at one of the restaurants we were doing was putting uh, all of her tips in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'd go after the machine and it'd be full of $1 bills. And uh, all right. so... <laughs> That's cool. How about you, Emilio? What's the smallest nomination out of your network? Uh, five bucks for our end, just because the, the fee got a little high and, you know, uh, at, at some point, uh, people were purchasing like, you know, a dollar and the fee was 50 bucks. So we were losing a lot of money. Yeah, it was crazy back in mean the transaction fees. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a mess for us. Too. Insane. Um, yes, sir. But it showed not expression. Um, so for uh, ordering the cash, you have machines that uh, kind of a lot of people sell their Bitcoin for cash. Yes, in the Austin market, we found that there's quite a few technologists there that were being paid from overseas employers, and they were looking for a liquidity source to be able to pay their rent and pay their other bills with fiat. I had machines in Austin for a while, but I don't ever remember there being a whole lot of cash demand, but I wasn't there uh, too long, only a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, I think part of it also was we created relationships very early on in the industry, having launched the first ATM there in Austin. And so there were people, quite a few dedicated clients, about a dozen or so. And those uh, probably represented about 80% of the cash withdrawals. Okay. Yeah, we have the similar thing on our network. We get a lot of people that are really, really repeat good customers uh, coming back over and over again for years. Yeah. So the pivot, the way I, I see it, I'd like to share is the evolution of the dream, I'm going to call it, but there's real underlying software that facilitates it, is the ability to take a traditional ATM and allow that ATM to operate on the U.S. network that gives people the ability to use their debit card in a pin present, debit card present transaction to that buy. That solves all the cash problems, too. It solves all the cash problems. The logistics of the ATMs already have cash in them. And in our particular case, the application would be that the customers, obviously all of our customers have to be registered on the network before we do a transaction with them. And we gamify the registration process if we're concerned about what they're doing with the crypto. And it's unfortunate, but we do and we have shut customers off. And when they play the game with us and they answer the questions and those questions are questions that are controversial in providing liquidity into those spaces, we immediately have to terminate their account with us and they can get pissed off. The premise yeah, inside, the yeah, the premise inside of the traditional ATM network is these customers are all fully vetted because they are already on the network through their conventional financial institution. And so the sources of funds are very clearly evident. They come to the traditional ATM, put in their card, put in their PIN number, and the ATM then asks them, do you want to do a bank transaction or do you want to do a VASET transaction? And then if they toggle into the VASET transaction mode, if they wanted to sell us, they would have already sent the crypto to us. They'll have a PIN, they'll enter that PIN, and that ATM will dispense the cash. Or if their objective is then to buy a virtual asset that we carry, then we then allow them to do the transaction as if they were doing a cash withdrawal. But of course, the cash is not dispensed. 
the crypto is dispensed. And to me, that's where I see the evolution of this industry going. And that's so important why we need to have a bank, because we have to have a merchant account to be able to process those pin debit card present transactions. Yeah. Yeah, Sheldon, I've been acquiring a whole bunch of a regular ATMs just for that reason. Um, I kind of envisioned, because of my banking troubles, that we could have a fully uh, kind of uh, sufficient network where people are selling their uh, Bitcoin and withdrawing cash from our uh, traditional ATMs, as well as just people purchasing Bitcoin with uh, traditional debit cards. So I have like, uh, I don't know, like maybe a little over 50 regular ATMs uh, right now and uh, expanding that to uh, more. But yeah, ho hopefully I, I can figure it out. Maybe we, sh we should talk after this, uh, this podcast. Absolutely. So that's where we're at. And it's uh, been a pleasure chatting with everybody. I don't know where we are on time. Any other questions for me you'd like me to attempt? Uh, yeah, I have a question for you, Sheldon. Um, I remember reading back uh, a while ago that in Texas, you could only have five Bitcoin machines before you were a money transmitter or uh, you needed an MTL license. Is that true or was I reading that wrong? Uh, I, can't, I cannot uh, really address that because my understanding is we never had a limit. Okay. All right. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. We never had a limit ourselves. Now, we were very... Uh, conscious of going into these known uh, areas. I can't remember the acronym, but there's a term that uh, FinCEN has identified as or being high-risk high, areas or something like high that. High-risk yeah, prime knows. areas. And we had been asked multiple times to launch down in South Texas and on the Mexican border, and we never went down there to launch any. We had the same and thing he, in Miami. There was a high-risk area or something, so we never launched there. Yeah. Really? And okay. Miami's a high-risk area, too. Huh. That's I the think only. That it was ahead. strange because I think also in Michigan that they had classified it as a high risk area because it was on the border of Canada, but we still did launch there. We haven't noticed any uh, high volume of Canadians coming to use the machines or anything or anything funny going on. Yeah. I wonder why Canada was considered high risk. I think That's it's just because it's a border. I think it's just because it's an international border. I don't think that it should be considered high risk. Yeah, I, I would have thought the. Uh, yeah, I mean, Canadians are. <laughs> I feel like Canadians are less less risk than than the Americans here. <laughs> I did try though about five years ago to open a Canadian bank account because uh, I think it was CA Vertex or something was an exchange in Canada, and there was some arbitrage opportunities there for my robot network. And I called. Man, I spent days. I must have called every bank in Canada, and none of them would let me open an account. Really? Is it just because you're a U.S. citizen? or I tried both as a business and as a U.S. citizen, and they all wanted tons of information. And uh, again, this is back in 2012, maybe, maybe even 2011. So back then, the banks weren't nearly as strict either. I mean, you could, back in these days... Uh you wanted to open a Bank of America business account, you just went online, you filled out an application, and you got a call from a banker later that day, and your account was open. Like when I opened my first Bank of America account for uh, EasyBit, I never visited a branch, wasn't required. So it, um, yeah, but a lot's changed since then. But uh, yeah, but yeah, I had oh, trouble yeah. opening a bank account in Canada, but I do know that in Michigan, a lot of people come from Canada, because you're allowed to just come over the border, and they come and work in uh, Michigan, and they go back to Canada at night. I live right near the bridge in Michigan, or my family does. It's uh, I, I don't know what it costs. It used to cost a quarter. It probably costs a dollar now, but you can just yeah. you know you drive right over. <laughs> uh, I think you do have to show your passport now, though. You used to just show your driver's license. Yeah, same thing over here in uh, in New York. You could just drive over and show your New York driver's license. Now I think you might be able to do an enhanced driver's license, or or maybe not. I, I don't remember. They, they <laughs> have this special passport card you can get for uh, entering by boat or by car. But yeah, um, I got that one. That yeah, I got that one too. But then I lost it. But uh, well, I, I'm not sure it's lost. It's probably uh, somewhere in my parents' house. I'm not sure where it is. It's, <laughs> it's lost. I'm going to get uh, audited or flagged at every border crossing for the rest of my life now. Um, Sheldon, do you guys do anything outside of the United States? Are you pretty much all focused uh, uh, as far as yeah. point false concerned? 
Yeah, everything we've been doing has been in the U.S. marketplace. The evolution to the banking piece and integrating into traditional ATMs will be across all the borders. And so hopefully this next six to nine months, we'll have something that will actually be able to be deployed. And I think we're pretty close. I think we've got the banking piece very well clearly defined. And we've got one of those charters out of Puerto Rico operating in Texas. And so that will be a very interesting piece. And Michael, to address the industries outside of just the crypto space that has banking issues relative to the hemp industry and the marijuana industry, this financial institution is very focused on being able to serve those because the way the Puerto Rican law is written, the Puerto Rican law who has the jurisdiction over this institution has clear defined guidelines to be able to serve that market as well. So how does it work exactly if you have a Puerto Rican bank, but they have a branch in Texas? Can that's correct. Elaborate a little bit how that can work. Uh, Simply that you're operating under the rules and regulations under the Puerto Rican charter. So under the U.S. charters, we have different guidelines and those guidelines as a stimulus to Puerto Rico's Puerto Rico's economy was extended this effectively, I'll call it a special purpose charter rather than what on the U.S. side we call a special purpose national bank charter. This special purpose charter really allows them to stimulate their economic infrastructure and their economy through the banking sector. And uh, I don't have my notes. I don't recall the, the ruling. I think it's a 268 charter, 269 charter. Don't quote me on that, but there's a special charter several of them have been found to be complicit in illegal and illicit activities and that's mm-hmm. the challenges with those charters there's only uh, 50 long or so charters been going on uh, i think it's about 8 years now 9 years okay. so are there a lot of puerto rican owned banks operating with branches in the united states uh, apparently there's 3 of these charters in the us Two of them have been found to be complicit in illegal and illicit activities. Obviously, we have nothing to do with those. And this institution out of Dallas is uh, the one that we're focused on. Obviously, I'm from Texas. They're in Texas. And so geographically, it's desirable to us to work through to get this finally clearly defined and the framework of the contractual relationships defined for the purposes of execution. And launching clarity just just likes everything easier for everyone that's all we need is a framework and some clarity here and i think that we'll find that these guys are poised in position to be able to serve our industry and i'm obviously an advocate of the industry and so as a proponent to make sure that we have a provider of this service that's critical i mean it's it's a paramount Without one it, of the few people that's been sticking through, uh, sticking in there for a while. I've been uh, uh, keeping an eye on you for quite a few years now. It's been, uh, yeah, you've been on quite a journey. Yeah, I've been swinging the bat, and I've missed the ball a lot. I can promise you, but I keep swinging the damn bat, and I more think you swing that it, more balls you'll hit. That's true. That's true. So again, I'm honored, and it's a pleasure to spend that morning with you guys here from sunny Puerto Vallarta. Uh, discussing Jeff, these topics any, that are uh, near and dear to me. Do you have any? Uh, we really appreciate you being here. We really do, Sheldon. Jeff, do you have any questions there from your end? Uh, no questions. It was a very illuminating chat, and I think it shows uh, that the industry is continuing to evolve and to make it more accessible uh, to everyone. And I think as uh, the fiat currency continues to devalue, right, uh, Bitcoin is definitely going to be the place to be. I think that uh, one thing you mentioned earlier, Sheldon, about persistence is uh, just really, really important. Uh, We have to remember here that a lot of us are in this for the long run. This is all we do. This is our life. And, uh, you know, we can't just we got to be careful and do things strategically because there's a lot of potential here. Emilio, do you have any uh, questions for Sheldon or any comments or any thoughts? No questions, but uh, Sheldon, really, really happy that you came on. Uh, and talk to us today. That was really, really informative. Thank you. We learn from each other, guys. This is a rising tide. Remember, we're all riding that tide together. So rising tide raises all ships equally. That's an old Absolutely. saying. All right. Well, that's cool. uh, 
that's an hour here, so I think uh, let's go ahead and tie this up so people can uh, get on their way. I really appreciate uh, our special guest today, Sheldon, for joining us. I hope that uh, sometime in the future, if you can find some time, that you can uh, come on and join us again. I will do that. I'd be happy to. And let's Amelia, all uh, maintain uh, our relationship here offline, please. Yes, absolutely. Uh, don't be a stranger at all. And uh, it's very important, especially with the Bitcoin ATM community growing as quickly as it is, that we don't uh, try to compete, but we try to collaborate and uh, decrease duplicity. And uh, yeah, all kind of move forward together. Uh, Jeff, uh, really appreciate you being here as usual and Amelia as well. Um, really, thank you guys. And uh, yeah, so uh, have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.